Torchbearers of History, a connected series of historical sketches. Volume 1, From the Earliest Times to the Reformation, by Amelia Hutchinson Sterling. Part 1, From Prehistoric Times to the Fall of the Roman Empire of the West. Chapter 1, Homer, The Mythical Period. If you look at a map of Europe, you will see that in the south it ends in three peninsulas. The most easterly of the three, or rather the southern part of it, is the country called Greece, and here it is that the history of Europe begins. The people of ancient Greece were perhaps the most wonderful people that ever lived. They lived in a beautiful country, where the sun was brighter, the sky bluer, the air clearer than we ever see them here. They loved beauty and all things beautiful, and they sought to put the beauty that they saw around them, the beauty of the mountain peaks that pointed to the sky, the beauty of the gently curved hill slopes, of the spring that leapt, sparkling from the earth, of the blue sea that stretched away, dotted with islets, and broken in a long white streak of foam, like a happy laugh on the rocky shore. They sought to put all that into everything they did, into the temples they built, the statues they carved, the poems they wrote, and the songs they sang. And they succeeded so far as it was possible to succeed. There are no nobler buildings in the world today than those which the old Greeks built 2,300 years ago. No finer statues than those of Greece have ever been carved, and no grander poems than theirs have ever been written. Greek history begins with what is called the mythical period, which just means that the part of history of Greece which is so far back in the past, and has got so mixed up with tales of wonderful deeds of heroes who lived, or were supposed to live, at that time, that it is not easy to tell how much of it is true and how much of it was invented by poets who lived long afterwards. The best known of the most interesting of all stories of the mythical period is the story of the Trojan War, which is supposed to have taken place in the 12th century BC, and which is the subject of the Iliad, the great poem of the first and the greatest poet of Greece, Homer. Now, though Homer's poems, the Iliad, and the Odyssey, are still in existence today, nearly 3,000 years after they were composed, and are being read by hundreds of scholars in different countries of the world. We know nothing about the poet himself, except that he seemed to have lived in the 10th century BC. We do not even know where he was born, whether in Greece itself, or in one of the Greek islands, or on the coast of Asia Minor where the Greeks had colonies. Seven towns laid claim to being the birthplace of the great poet, but none of them proved its claim. And now some scholars want to make out that no single poet ever wrote the Iliad and the Odyssey, and that these poems are the work of several different poets, and that Homer never lived at all. But we will not believe that. We will believe that Homer lived, probably, in Asia Minor. It does not matter exactly where. A simple childlike man, as all great men are, with a simple childlike worship for noble deeds and feats of arms, with a great love of Greece and everything Greek in his heart, who was far from thinking that the tales he told of Greeks at Troy would be read by people in lands as yet unknown, long after the language in which they were written had ceased to be spoken. Homer's poem, the Iliad, contains, as I have told you, the story of the Trojan War, and is named for Troy, or Ilium, a town in Asia Minor. More than 1100 years before Christ was born, there lived Troy, a king called Priam, and he had many sons and many daughters, and the best known of his sons were Paris and Hector, the brave hero of Troy. Now it was Paris who caused the great Trojan War, which lasted for ten years. But when he was staying in Sparta, a 
town in Greece. He carried away Helen, the most beautiful woman living in Greece, carried her away over the sea to his home in Troy to be his wife. Then messengers came from Sparta, demanding Helen from the king Priam. But Paris did not wish to let her go. So he persuaded his father to refuse to give her up. Great was the anger of the Spartans when the messengers returned without the beautiful Helen. The king of Sparta, Menelaus, sent messengers to all the kings and the chiefs round about, begging them to help him. Greece at that time was not governed by one sovereign, as Great Britain is, but many kings and chiefs and princes ruled over different parts. When the messengers from King Menelaus reached these rulers, they gathered together their men, and got ready their ships, and set sail all together to bring back the beautiful Helen from Troy. When the Greek fleet reached the Trojan shore, the men drew up their swift, curved ships upon the beach, and set up their tents, and spread themselves out over the plain before the city. And many were the battles, and single fights between the Greeks and the people of Troy, and at times the Trojans won and at times the Greeks, but always the greatest glory fell to the lot of Achilles, the son of Peleus, the bravest hero of the Greeks. At length it happened that Agamemnon, the leader of the Greek host, Agamemnon, king of men, as Homer calls him, cast eyes of longing on a prize which brave Achilles had won in fight and he sent men to lead away the prize from the tent of Achilles. Then Achilles was filled with anger against King Agamemnon, and he swore that he should not again lift his sword to do battle for the Greeks, and that his countrymen should feel the loss of the strong arm in the fight for the insult which they had offered to him. So he refused any more to join the battle against the men of Troy and he sat alone by the swift ships, gazing out upon the wide sea, sorrowful and sad of heart. Now, while swift-footed Achilles sat apart, withdrawn from the fight, the battle raged between the Trojans and the Greeks, and Hector, the brave son of King Priam of Troy, challenged many of the bravest of the Greeks to single fight, and those who fought with him he slew, one after the other. From there was no man in all the army of the Greeks who was fit to stand up against him, save only godlike Achilles. So day by day the Greeks became weakened in strength and in spirit, and at length the pride of Agamemnon was humbled, and he sent messengers to swift-footed Achilles, begging him to come and fight once more with his countrymen, and offering to restore him the prize which had been taken from him, and add to it many rich presents of gold and of silver. But Achilles still refused to fight, for he said, I will not join in battle or in council with Agamemnon, for he hath once already deceived and injured me, and he shall not again cheat me with his fair words. So the messengers sadly bore back the message of swift-footed Achilles to Agamemnon king of men. Now Achilles had a dear friend in the Grecian host named Patroclus, and Patroclus was grieved in heart when he saw how the Greeks were stricken by the Trojans because Achilles had withdrawn himself from the fight, and how the bravest of the Greek heroes was slain by the hand of a man slaying Hector, the son of King Priam. And Patroclus reproached Achilles for so long cherishing his anger against King Agamemnon, and prayed that, if he himself would not fight, he would at least suffer him to array himself in his armour, and so lead forth his men to battle against the Trojans. So Achilles suffered him, and Patroclus clad himself in the glittering armour of Achilles, and led forth his men to battle and many brave deeds he did in the fight, till at length he fell by the hand of the hero Hector, 
who stripped him of his armour of Achilles, which Achilles had suffered him to wear. Now while Achilles sat alone by the ships, gazing sadly out upon the sea, a messenger came to him to tell him that the brave Patroclus had fallen, and that his splendid armour had become the prize of Hector, the son of Priam. Then Achilles was overcome with grief, and he threw himself on the ground and wept, and sprinkled himself with ashes, and tore his hair and his garments. But silver-footed Thetis, the goddess of the sea, who was the mother of Achilles, was grieved when she beheld the sorrow in her dear son, and she rose from the depths of the sea, and stood beside him, and spoke to him soothing words, bidding him to tell her what was grieving him. So in sad words Achilles bewailed his lot to his mother, telling her how his dear comrade Patroclus had fallen in the battle, how he was unable to avenge his death because his splendid armour had become the prize of the man-slaying Hector, and how, while the fight was raging and the Greeks were stricken by the Trojans, he, Achilles, the champion of the Greeks, was sitting idle by the ships, a useless burden on the earth. Then Thetis spoke gentle words to him, comforting him and promising to return at dawn the following day bringing him a suit of armour more splendid than that which he had lost. And straightway the silver-footed goddess sped to Olympus, the mountain on which the old Greeks believed that the gods and goddesses had their homes. And she besought Vulcan, the god of fire, whom she found busy in the great forge, that he would make a suit of armour for her brave son Achilles, the hero of the Greek host, and Vulcan granted her prayer, and he wrought a splendid helmet, fitted to the brows of Achilles, and a breastplate to cover his chest, and greaves for his limbs, and a wonderful shield, the like of which has never been seen before or since. So when the eastern sky was red with the rising morn, silver-footed Thetis soon stood once more beside her dear son, bearing the glittering armour which the god Vulcan had wrought for him. And Achilles clad himself in the armour, and went forth to do battle for the Greeks, and to avenge the death of his dear friend Patroclus. And wherever he appeared, the tide of battle turned in favour of the Greeks, and single-handed he slew many of the bravest Trojans, and at length he came against Hector, the champion of Troy. But when Hector beheld him approaching, clad in his wonderful armour, which blazed like fire, fear seized upon him, and he took to flight. Three times he fled round the walls of Troy, and three times swift-footed Achilles pursued him, till at length Hector strengthened himself and resolved to fight against his foe. Then he stood up against Achilles, and the two heroes did battle together, and Hector was slain, and Achilles tied his dead body to his chariot, and dragged it through the dust to the camp of the Greeks. The rest of the Iliad tells how the Trojans lamented for the loss of their bravest champion, and how the aged king Priam, the father of Hector, made his way into the darkness of night, through the camp of the Greeks, to the tent of Achilles and besought him to deliver up the body of Hector, that the Trojans might give him honourable burial. We are glad to think that the noble Achilles was touched by the sorrow of the old king, and gave up to him the body of his son, and Priam bore the body back to Troy, and the Trojans mourned over it, and buried it in pomp and state.